I'm from Amsterdam. I was born uh, in the Netherlands. I still live in Amsterdam, even though I lived throughout the world and worked throughout the world in numerous places. Um, I founded a couple of businesses before I founded uh, Think. And um, I've been a strategy consultant, innovation consultant with Accenture and McKinsey. And I used to be a DJ. So I used to uh, DJ at parties. At parties. I'm also a field ready driver. So th those are the things that you can talk to me about if you don't, don't want to talk about innovation. And this is where I work. This is the place uh, I really uh, spend quite a bit of time and I really like. It's called Think, School of Creative Leadership. And this is what it looks like. It's, um, this building is in Amsterdam, it's in a park. It's an old factory building. Inside, we made it an open and creative space to work in. And now it looks quite neat and clean, but this is how it usually looks. Usually it's messy, there's lots of people working, lots of people working together, trying to come up with new ideas and innovations. So why is that interesting? Now this is what we did. We uh, started thinking about this concept in, somewhere in 2011. We didn't have a place, we were a team of five people, we are just dreaming up this school. In 2012 we launched. We had lo one location, we had a team of about 12 people, we started training about 60 people, and then every year we started growing. And we started growing double digit. We started growing 100% a year or more. Um, so now in 2015, um, we cover five locations in the world. So we're in Amsterdam, we've got a partnership with Stanford where we train, we've got our own location in um, uh, Vancouver, we've got a location in Lisbon, we're working in Shanghai. So we've got multiple locations where we work. Um, we will probably have end of the year about 160 per people working with us. Come on in, don't worry, come on in. And uh, we'll probably have trained about 2,000 people physically, people we've met and touched. This is not online yet. So we've been growing quite aggressively in the middle of a crisis, in a brick and mortar business, in, um, in education, which is quite a boring field. So um, where did this come from? How did we start? We started, um, we started, and I love numbers, and I was fascinated by this picture. This picture says um, that if you ask CEOs what they think about innovation, 84% says innovation is important for their organization to grow. 80% says they need innovation to defend themselves against, against new market entry, uh, entrance, against uh, other uh, com uh, competitors sweeping in. They need to defend their market. And then only 6% is satisfied with the innovation they have in their organization. There is nothing else that you can interview a CEO on where the gap between what they want and what they have is this big. There is no field, you can ask about marketing, about sales, about operations, even about post-merger integration, which is one of the most difficult things you can do, integrating businesses after a merger. The, uh, the gap between what they have and what they want is never as big as this. Now, if you look at the biggest companies in the world, so um, if you look at the uh, Fortune 50, the 50 biggest organizations in the world, what you see here, on the y-axis is the growth rate of those companies. So you see the growth they make. And you see in the couple of years before big organizations enter the Fortune 50, that they still grow. They grow with somewhere around 15%. Then the year they enter the Fortune 50, the first year, they still grow. They grow even more. They grow 30%. After that, you see it's flat. So it's even more difficult for big organizations to innovate. It's really tough. And you see that their performance is lacking. This is a study that came out in 2011 by uh, IBM, who identified the need for creative leadership. And since then, there have been tons of studies like this. 
that identify the need within organizations to come up with innovation, whether you call that creativity, leadership, innovation, entrepreneurship, it doesn't really matter. Um, tons of um, quotes that are very similar to this. And then if we take an even bigger picture, there's a lot of issues in, uh, in the world that we face that are not going to be solved by the same thinking that we had yesterday or by the same thinking that created those problems. Think about pollution, think about unfair distribution of wealth and health, think about um, mega cities coming up, congestion, whatever problem you take, it will need a new approach. So this is all the things that started prompting us. Wouldn't it be cool to create a school that builds leaders that can tackle those issues? We call them creative leaders. So we needed to reframe. We needed to reframe what it was. If you don't want to build leaders that solve issues with the same kind of thinking that created the issue, then you shouldn't be building a school that teaches the same stuff. You shouldn't be building a school that does the same thing. So we wanted to reframe. And for us, reframing means something very specific. So maybe I can ask you all to stick your finger in the air like this. So look at the ceiling and imagine there's a clock on the ceiling. And just turn your finger clockwise. So turn it from 1, 2, to 6, to 9, to 12, and continue turning clockwise. And then slowly but surely, bring your finger down. So keep on turning and bring it down. Keep on turning clockwise, bring it down until it's underneath your face. Now look on your finger. Which direction is it turning? Counterclockwise, yeah, come in. Counterclockwise, so what happened? Sorry? Yeah, you changed your point of view, right? We changed our perspective. We looked from one side, now we look from another side. That's what reframing is. And to give you an even more concrete example, um, this is Mauritius, and one of the participants we trained, he's from Mauritius, he advises, advises the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister on, um, on how to deal with the country. And Mauritius, I don't know if you've, who's, who's been to Mauritius? One person, lucky you. It's beautiful. So it's these white beaches, coconut trees. It's where you take your wife on your honeymoon. It's really nice, right? Um, if you live there, it's not that nice. If you live there, it's polluted. Uh, the, their economy floats on the global economy because, of course, they live off tourism and it's a really expensive location to get there. It takes hours to fly there. It's really far, really expensive. Um, so their economy isn't doing too well and they're facing a brain drain. The smart people are leaving the country but because the jobs inside the country are not that interesting. So they were facing these troubles. And just to explain you what a reframe is, let me talk you through what they did. The first thing they did is they said, what is the thing we believe? What is our core belief? And the way they think about their country is they think it's a small and irrelevant island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Which is true, right? It is really small and irrelevant. So, um, it's only 2,000 square kilometer. Its main asset, the island, is sinking, or the ocean is rising. So the only thing they have is getting smaller. Then it's got an irrelevant GDP, 20 billion. It's not really big in any economic sense in, uh, in the world. And then it's far away from everywhere. So that's the next thing they did. They defined why do we believe that this? Why do we hold this to be true? The next thing they said is let's turn those beliefs upside down. Let's um, say at least we've got huge waters. And um, the, the island is sinking. Well, at least the waters are getting bigger, right? Let's assume we're a serious world economic power. And let's assume we're close to everything. And that last point is actually maybe not even that weird, because Mauritius is on the main trading routes it used to be. If you look at those rat bubbles, and if you take those for granted, if you would assume those were true, whether they are or aren't, doesn't matter, then you could look from a reframe perspective. You could see what would be another perspective to look at our island. And this is what they found. 
they said, we're the largest ocean state in the world. Now that's very interesting. If you start looking from this perspective, all of a sudden these problems become opportunities. All of a sudden, if you look from this perspective, you're going to come up with all kinds of different ideas. So when they looked at those problems, they used to think, how are we going to get more people to the island that spend more, that pollute less, and, that create, and then do stuff with them that makes it for interesting jobs? It's a really difficult equation to solve. It's almost impossible to solve. Whereas if you look from this perspective, if you look at your island as the largest ocean state in the world, all of a sudden, what are you going to do? You're going to do ocean farming. They are building a Google data center on the island because all it needs is power, a little bit of which is easy from the ocean, cooling, which is easy from the ocean, and positive legisl legislation, which is really easy if you're a small island. And they're creating medicine out of fish. So you see, by reframing their perspective, by looking at their problem from a different angle, all of a sudden, they saw new opportunities. So that's what we started to do. Um, I'd like to again invite you to pick a person that's sitting next to you. Maybe the person you just introduced yourself to, maybe the person you were already sitting with. And ask each other, what would be your core belief? What's the sacred cow inside your company? That, what's the one thing that your organization believes that holds you back in terms of innovation? And make sure you only pick a negative core belief. If you start reframing, I love my wife, you get into trouble, yeah? So take two minutes to discuss with your neighbor what is your core belief? What is the one thing that's holding you back? Go. So one minute, so make sure you switch if you haven't done so yet. So if you want, take that home and try for yourself when you're back home to reframe this. Go through those steps of defining what were the supporting beliefs, why, did you believe, why do you believe this to be true. Take some opposites and try and believe in those opposites and see whether there's another perspective to look at. Um, now this is not that easy actually, um, usually it would take me about 30 minutes to guide you through this process, but we build an online tool. If you go to reframe.think.org, there's an online tool that takes you through this process. So you don't all have to call me up, um, but you can still do that if you want. Good. So what could a school look like? What would this be? Um, what should this school look like and how would we develop it? We call it Think. Um, 
just to put out there a name that sounded different, that looked different, and that inspired people to um, think about it in a different way. A logo that doesn't look like a university. And um, we came up with a couple of core beliefs of our own, or a couple of things that we hold to be true. We think that the largest challenges are multidimensional. We think that um, they're, um, that business um, and doing business in the world today warrants a commitment to people, planet, and profit. We believe that the world needs creative and innovative solutions. And we believe leadership to be an individual act. So leadership is not a collective thing. There is no town or city in the world with a statue for a committee. It doesn't exist. There's only statues for individuals. We believe leadership is an individual act. And we believe de uh, developing leaders needs to be an experiential. So where did we start? Well, we started looking at where does innovation come from? We started looking at organizations that make innovation happen. Places where people come up with creative concepts and new ideas. Um, we started talking to architects who imagine new worlds, new buildings. And we started working with organizations that drive innovation and build new things. And we invited the leaders from those organizations to work with us. We asked the CEO of McKinsey, um, a board member of Pixar, one of the best architects in the world, people from Facebook, people from Stanford, people from um, Indian Business School, Amazon, um, um, Marcel Wanders, who's called Lady Gaga of Design by, um, by Newsweek. Um, crazy people, people with completely different perspectives. Half the time I'm in the room with these people, they don't understand each other because they come from such different worlds. And that's what inspires us. That's what helped us to come up with this concept of the school. That's what helped us come up with all kinds of ideas of how we would do this. So again, I'd like to ask you, these were our creative leaders. These are the people that we think, for us, inspired us. For us, helped us to create. And of course, there's many more. We interviewed about 250 of these kind of people, maybe 300. Um, who are the people you look up to? Who are the leaders that you consider a creative leader and why? What are their personality traits? So again, I'd like to ask you in pairs to discuss for a minute, who is your creative leader and what makes him or her such a creative leader? And we'll go around the room, I'll get a couple of quotes, and then we'll look at what does that make? What is the, what is the 360 view of what a creative leader looks like? So take a minute, minute, minute and a half together to talk about who's your favorite creative leader and why.
So I just learned about a Romanian guy called Mircea Tudor, if I pronounce that right. We talked about why he would be a creative leader. And apparently he was able to, to envision stuff that was completely new and to realize it. So to build stuff that you don't have yet, but we really need. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What, what did you talk about? What, what, what made your creative leader a creative leader? From our organization or? <laughs> we consider Marta to be our creative leader, so. <laughs> and what makes her? Um, ambition, passion. Uh, she is determined to do what she puts in her mind. Thank you. So ambition and passion, uh, vision. What did you guys talk about? Uh, I, uh, the first name that came into my mind was uh, Richard Branson, because I think he never stops. And that's like, he always has that drive to do more and more and more. And that's, I think, for me, a creative leader. Yeah, so realizing things, right? It's not just about the idea and the vision, it's also about making something happen. What did you guys talk about? Which one was? Uh, I think that a creative leader would have to, you know, inspire other people around him to be creative as well. That's the... It's very interesting. This is... I don't think I've had a group that within this amount of time got all of the, the things that we typically ask for, that we people th typically think about. So um, we've done, we've inter interviewed two, two, three hundred people, uh, two, three hundred creative leaders, including the uh, like Richard Branson's of this world, asking them what made them successful. But we also did something else. We looked at all the capabilities and competencies that are defined. And there's this big book, it's called Luminger, and it describes all the competencies that exist in the world. And we just went through and we tossed everything out that we didn't think was relevant and we tried to cluster the rest. So we did like a bottom-up and a top-down approach. And we came up with this model. We think there's five things to a creative leader. We think a creative leader needs to have passion and purpose, needs to know why he or she is doing what, they, what he or she does. Um, uh, a creative leader has to have an explorative mindset, has to try new stuff, has to look at things from a different perspective. These are things that are very close to self, right? Uh, much harder to build. Then we think a creative leader has to be able to envision new future, envision new things. To orchestrate creative teams, which you talked about, um, ma making other people successful and having other people follow. And then finally, bre drive breakthrough change, make stuff happen. Those are the five things. And um, we've measured now those 2,000 people that I talked about that we've been training. We've measured all of them on these competencies um, and all the sub-competencies and we learned quite a bit about where the strengths and weaknesses are. And one of the big things is that you cannot have them all. There is natural tensions in this model. So you're either good at one thing or good at the other thing. So that's the way we look at this. Um, this is the first thing we and this is the first thing we defined, together with that group I, I named. The second thing we defined is what are we going to do? We are in business to uh, create a cadre of creative leaders, uh, to train a bunch of people who are able to envision new futures, to make them happen and show leadership in that context. And then we want to come up with creative solutions to the large societal challenges we face. Um, we define ourselves as a C-school, and this is actually a, an external research agency came up with this concept, we didn't do it ourselves. But if you take the alphabet and you go from A to E, from art school to business school to C-school to D-school, design school and E, engineering school, then we place ourselves kind of in the middle. So we're not a business school in the sense of we're training management. We're training innovation leadership. And we're not a design school in the definition of we develop, pro we design products and services. We try and design business. So it's somewhere in that middle. 
that we position ourselves. And then we started defining what should our participants look like. And we took inspiration from a guy called David Ogilvie. And many of you are in the, in the communications industry, so you might know him. But for the people who don't know him, in the time when Mar Marvin Bauer founded McKinsey and therefore founded the uh, consulting industry, David Ogilvie did exactly the same for the PR uh, industry. He invented the PR industry. And um, he, um, he sent every single one of his HR managers across the globe a Matryoshka doll. And in the smallest doll, he put a little uh, piece of paper with this text on it. If we all recruit people that are smaller than us, we'll end up with an army of dwarves. Whereas if we all recruit people that are bigger than us, we will end up with an army of giants. So that's the way we think about it. That's the way we think about recruiting. And I've got a team of now about 10 people around the world recruiting our participants, the people that follow our programs, our students, if you will. And this is what hangs above all of their desks. So all of them are looking at it from this perspective. Um, a couple of examples. Um, Shona McDonald is from South Africa. She runs a wheelchair uh, company in South Africa, building wheelchairs for disabled kids in third world countries. Started in South Africa and now uh, through the program is expanding into the world, uh, specifically Southeast Asia. Um, it's about a million dollar business. And, and she's managed to make a little bit of money, make a living out of giving wheelchairs to disabled kids in third world countries. Um, Shemi Jacob, um, Shemi De Jacob uh, used to live in the Netherlands, is originally from India, now just went back to India to clean up the railway system. And has anyone ever been in India in a, in a train? So you might have noticed that if you sit in a train in India, somebody comes by to sell you food every 1.3 minutes. Every 1.3 minutes, somebody comes by to sell you food. All that food is packaged. All that food is bought. And there's no waste bin, so everything is being thrown out of the window. So you can imagine what the tracks look like. And he started a project cleaning up those railways. Another example is Ava. She's driving innovation in Vodafone and trying to really get the workforce to take a completely different perspective. And then finally, um, actually I talked about Nishan already. Nishan is trying to uh, solve the issues that we talked about earlier in reframing uh, the issues of Mauritius. So very different kind of people. We recruit people from all over the globe. On average, they're between 30 and, uh, or on average, they're 40 years old. They're between 30 and early 60s. They're, um, we cap every nationality at 15%. And they come from business, from government, from startup world, from social enterprise, everywhere. Very diverse. And together with them, we try and tackle challenges. So I talked earlier about those couple of statements on the top of the slide where I said leadership development has to be experiential. You cannot learn innovation from a textbook. You cannot learn innovation by just watching a video. You just have to do it. In the old days when um, uh, the painters used to train their pupils, and in my country we had Van Gogh, who's a, a famous pa painter, um, he would train his pupils by painting together with them. So they would paint the hands and the feet of the people he would be painting. And then we, he would help them and correct their mistakes. So just by doing together you learn. And we believe that it's the same for innovation. So with our faculty, with the people around us, with the people you saw before, and with our participants, together we try and not come up with creative solutions to large societal challenges. So we actively innovate together. We do that on all sorts of to topics, like the future of energy, the future of mobility. We think about what's gonna happen with big data and what's gonna happen with health. So very diverse range of topics that, um, that we co cover. 
So just for you to think about by yourself, just take 30 seconds to think about what are the leaders that you are creating? What are the leaders that you're either following or that you're creating and employing? And what, together with them, are you trying to achieve? Just take 30 seconds. So we started with innovating leaders. We started with the executive program I just talked to you, uh, talked to you about. And at a, third, a certain point, they started calling us up and asking us, can you help my organization? Because now I'm back in my organization, but I've got way more people. There's thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people working in my organization. Or in smaller organization, hundreds of people or tens of, uh, dozens of people that um, need to innovate with me and need to come up with these solutions themselves. So can you start helping us? So we started working with all kinds of corporations. Um, so this was about two years ago that the first company called us up. It was a hotel chain called Kempinski. And um, they run about 80 hotels all over the world. We started working with them and we trained their top 300 people or so and then more organizations come on board so right now we're working with this is Facebook with booking.com with shell with ING but also with other organizations we're working with cities to reimagine what a city could be um, with the city of Amsterdam with the city of Shanghai with the city of Vancouver reimagining now that we know that everybody's flocking to the cities, and every city will become a mega city. Um, we know what's going to happen. We can foresee the congestion. We can foresee what's going to happen with health and well-being in, in those cities. And you can foresee that there's quite a bunch of issues that we, can, we will have to solve. So we're trying to reimagine what cities are like. And we're trying to reimagine what countries will be like. So we're working with the World Economic Forum, we're working with, um, uh, with uh, some of the leaders in China, some of the leaders in the Netherlands. This is a picture that I love. It's, um, this is actually my country. So this is the Netherlands. It's a little bit cut out. In the middle there's a big lake. And then there's sea. And you might know that we have dikes around our country. Actually, all of our country is below sea level. Uh, so we build all these dikes. And this is from a project I did about 15 years ago with the Dutch government. Um, and I kept the picture because I loved it so much. They asked us um, to think about what our new airport could be. And we imagined that it would be so nice to have an airport in the sea so that we don't have the pollution within the country, in the middle of the country in Amsterdam. And we thought it would be nice to have a big tulip on the coast. And um, this is just a fun picture, but I think what it translates for me is, um, we just made this picture that the whole island never got built. They built a palm tree somewhere else, um, but this island never got done. Um, but the picture just survived. And there's some real power in creating these big visuals. These visual, uh, visuals that stretch people's imagination. And that's something I took with. Um, to try and create, if you have this new project, create a cool name. Uh, for us, the name Think Worked. Create a cool name, create a cool visual, so you can translate your idea in one picture to people. So that's where we are now. Um, trying to work with individuals, with organizations, with uh, cities and with countries. Um, Actually, that, that was where we, where we landed about nine months ago. And 
Um, then I met my mentor, so he's a really smart guy, and he asked me, Mark, where, uh, where do you want to be in 10 years' time? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, just how, how big do you want to be? Give me a number. I said, what kind of number? He said, well, it doesn't matter. Put it in dollars. So I tossed out a number, and he said, so how big are you now? Well, that was a very, very small fraction of that. He said, what is your growth rate? He said, that. So he sketched it out, he said, you're never going to get there. Never ever. Not in your lifetime, my friend. Um, so there's these moments when you're like, I have to reimagine it again. And um, one of my other mentors always said, well, at least you can take a piece of paper. Whenever you're stuck, there's always a white sheet of paper you can start drawing again. So I started thinking about um, how, can we, how can we scale this more? How can this become bigger? Because if you think about wanting to change a large part of the world, um, then if you start doing the math, there's actually a lot of people you have to reach. It's not hundreds, it's not thousands. It's, about, um, it's somewhere between one and five million. Um, so it's a lot of people you have to reach. And um, so we started grabbing a piece of paper and I started, we started thinking about, so what could we then do? We said, actually it's weird. Uh, we send people to these places. This is a picture of Stanford, right? Um, we send people to school and we teach them. We teach them a lot. Four years, five years, whatever it is. For a long time we teach them. We tell them all these things. They stick it in their head, then most of it they lose, and then some of it they need later on, and when they need it, they kind of forget it, or they forgot it. They know how to get back to it, yes, that's okay. But it's a weird kind of model, if you live in a society that looks like this. So I typed in yesterday, how do I remove a stain from a white shirt? On the top right corner, 210,000 results on YouTube. All videos that are less than three minutes to watch. Oh, well, less than five minutes to watch, right? This is the world we live in. I've got a problem now, I can solve it now. And we're still sending people to these institutes. Really weird paradigm in dime if you think about it. I'm not saying we should abolish universities and schools. They've got a very good place in the world. Um, it is interesting if you think about developing innovation skills. Is there another way to do it? And the way we started thinking about is, is this axis between sending people to Stanford and having results and answers in the here and now. Want to know the fifth digit behind the come off pi? Type it into Google, got it. Um, Want to know what the time is now in, I don't know, Holland? Type it into Google, get it now. All these answers are here now. So what could be a way to work with organizations to help people drive organization? So um, this was the question we asked ourselves. How might we hardwire innovation into organizations? And we came up with something that looks a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of frames of this. Looks a little bit of like, like this. Um, we build a platform, something online, that creates contextual learning. So that doesn't talk you through everything you need to know now in order for you to use it when you need it. It just gives you the information you need right, uh, in the moment. So for example, here somebody posted in a stream a prototype. Here's a button there called what is, what is this? You, you hit it, you get a video of somebody explaining it. Highly contextual. Um, we allow people to innovate together. And we force them to do the right things. So for example, if people post an idea in this case, you cannot comment on an idea. What does comment mean? Usually people, if they comment, they just talk it down. So in this case, we force them to give a good note, as we call it. So you can innovate together, build on each other. And the building on each other, which is a concept I can explain you in the classroom, and I can teach you how to do it. We just enforce it here. Um, 
we build a way to uh, capture and explore everything you create. During your creative process, there's all these ideas that pop up. There's insights from your research. There's user needs that you see. All of them. We capture it all. We keep it. And you can navigate it. Here on the left side, you see something that looks a little bit like what online retail would look like, right? Women's wear, skirts, blue. Men's wear, belts, black. Um, so you can, you can select for your company what are the ideas for um, innovating cinemas in Japan? What are the insights we had on changing the check-in process in our hotels in Europe? Statistics that allow you to see who's innovating where and how fast and how much and how well. And of course, anywhere and everywhere. Um, if you want to try this, for everyone who's here today, um, uh, drop me a note and you'll get free access to try this out, play around with it. So that's it. The only question for you now is, um, we believe the world needs creative leaders. We be, uh, believe the, the world needs new ideas, new creations. So what are you going to create? What are you going to make and how can we help? Drop me a note, shoot me a message, love to connect. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. If you have questions for Mark, please. I just wanted to ask you about your email again because I didn't, I wasn't quick enough to catch it. Um, mark at thnk.org. Oh, it's, it's curved with the earth, but... Yeah. <laughs> questions? So we don't have questions, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> Thank you Coffee again, Mark. <laughs> Thank you again, Mark. Mark va sta cu noi astăzi toată ziua, așa că puteți să vorbiți cu el. Știu că toată lumea vrea să vorbească față în față. M-am obișnuit la conferințe. O să vă invit la o scurtă pauză și aș vrea să vă spun înainte de pauză că în sala 6, lângă noi, noi suntem la sala 5, este sala 4DX. Din 7 în 7 minute încep demo-uri. Vă invit să mergeți să vedeți. Credeți-mă și eu când am intrat în sală să văd cum este 4DX, am zis, ok, o să fie, o să fie frumos. Am simțit nevoia, după primul minut, să-mi pun o centură. O căutam cu mâna. Așa că merită să încercați. Durează două sau trei minute demo-ul. Din șapte în șapte minute se vor face calupuri de intrat în sală. Deci aveți timp și de cafea și de vizionat. O să primiți ochelari la intrare și o să vă vorbească bucnici după o sesiune despre ce înseamnă 4DX. Vă mulțumesc și vă invit la pauză.